welcome everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to say that the Open Table Network is now a charity. So as a result, we've asked several notable Christians who identify as LGBTQIA+, or as allies, to become our patrons. They're advocates for our network, speaking about us and supporting us in the public eye. We're proud that they believe in what we're doing and want to have their names associated with us. This is the sixth of our Q&A webinars with our new patrons. And tonight I am delighted that we're in conversation with Christian songwriter, John Bell. In John's message to the Open Table Network on our anniversary last year, he said that I believe that there have to be places where people can have it affirmed that diversity is part of God's plan. John is a hymn writer, a Church of Scotland minister, and a member of the Iona community, which is a dispersed Christian community working for peace, social justice, rebuilding community and renewal of worship. John is also a broadcaster and former student activist. He works around the world, lecturing in theological colleges in the UK, Canada and the USA. He has produced many collections of original hymns and songs published by the Iona community. In 2017, John came out as gay in front of hundreds of people in a talk at Greenbelt called Rampant Heterosexualism. Um, he's remained single because he believed that this enabled him to work without hindrance or compromise in the past as a public Christian and fulfill his commitment in the Church of Scotland. It's good to have you with us, John. I should have introduced myself as well at the beginning, so I'll go back and do that now. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Alex and I'm one of the co-chairs of Open Table Network and I'm a trans Christian and minister in the United Reformed Church. But back to you, John. Um, it's wonderful to be able to speak with you this evening. Before I ask you anything too heavy, could you tell us a wee bit about your faith journey? Oh, yes. Well, I uh, grew up in a, a home where I don't think that I ever saw a Bible, but where my mother particularly was a believer. And I went to the usual things that children of believers went to, you know, the, the church uh, and the Sunday school. And um, I think when I was probably, I was my most religious when I was 13, I went to a boys' brigade Bible class, then the church, and then another Bible class. And the thing that confused me and almost turned me off religion was that each of these began with a prayer of confession three times within three hours. And once when I was 14, I went to an evening service and discovered that that began with a prayer of confession. I, I couldn't imagine what, what people were doing between 12 o'clock in the morning and half past six at night. That they had to be groveling before God. So from that stage on, I think that I have seen or regarded faith as a journey, and a journey which involves the asking of hard questions, and and, and also uh, ex the expectation that there are things always to discover. Um, I would probably, around the age of maybe 16, uh, felt that I had a calling to the ministry. Uh, I, I mean, it's not something that's in my, in my family or in my blood. And I kind of rebelled against it, and then finally, uh, you know, felt well. This is where I should go, which was a big surprise to everybody, including myself. And uh, I had to be analysed by the church to see if I was serious and whether I had it in me to go ahead. And I was ordained when I was about twenty-seven or 20, twenty-eight, perhaps. I'd done other things before that, and student politics, uh, social work. And I was a couple of years working in Amsterdam in a local church there. And since then, I've spent around 10 years in youth work. And then the rest of the time, I've been working in the area where I'm working now. My One of my primary passions is to do with the way in which we read the Bible. Uh, I, th I think I've had to give up most of what I learned when I studied scripture in college. Uh, which was a hierarchical model where there were answers to the insoluble questions. And if, if you only read the right books or you listened to the right lectures, you would be able to deal with that. And all my work now, or much of it, is to do with enabling people 
uh, who don't have an academic background to feel that they can discover things within scripture which are for their own, own growing in faith and that my job is to enable that and then to en endorse you know these insights which which incredible incredible people have and I really regret the belonging to the the Presbyterian Church in Scotland which believes itself to be founded on the priesthood of all believers that it's taken me until the second half of my life to actually believe in the priesthood of all believers and that the intellect is one conduit for reckoning on the deep things of life and of faith. But there's also experience and intuition and insight and imagination, which people on the, people on the ground have. That's a long answer to a short question. Absolutely, no, it's a, a brilliant answer. Um, so I'm not gonna ask you too much about music this evening, but it would be remiss of me not to ask anything. Um, you might not remember this, and I don't remember it very well, but. We first met when I was about five years old, a long, long time before my transition. Um, it was a music week on Iona. I was the only young child there and I didn't have an instrument. Um, and you found two film canisters, which I hope everyone here knows what a film canister is. Um, but you found two film canisters and you filled one with rice and the other one with lentils. And they were my maracas for the week. And I remember the feeling, I don't really remember a lot of stories about that week, but I remember that it felt really good to be included. And I talked about that quite a lot when I was training at music college, um, because that feeling of inclusion in music mattered to me. So I was wondering if you could give us any tips for making music in our church communities more accessible and inclusive. <laughs> I'm smiling a wee bit because this morning, I was dealing with this for two hours with students at Santa's University, and uh, I, I, don't, I don't tend to repeat that. Well, I'll just say a couple of things. Most church musicians who are in charge of music are introverts. This is not for a moment to say that that's a bad thing, but particularly organists, they, 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 nobody knows who they are, and they hide behind a machine that makes the most noise. Or, or people, some people who are highly extrovert love nothing more than having a guitar in their hands and an audience to listen to them. For church music to develop, the introvert has to leave his introversion and become known to the congregation as an enabler and interested in the musical potential of the congregation. And the extrovert has to realize that he or she is not the most important, they are not the most important people around and that their job is an enabling job and not a performing job. Mm -hmm. So much church music has been predicated on what choirs can do, what gifted instrumentalists can do, uh, what people who are you know, amazing singers can do. And we move from what should be a participative right or, or, or experience to a performance right. And we kind of assess how so-and-so plays the guitar, so-and-so drums or whatever, rather than, than feeling this is a corporate uh, act together. So I, you know, I, I encourage people to, to make music with their congregation creatively, because I believe that when people who, who, who don't profess to have musical skills discover that they can sing, and some of them can do other things as well, and they're enabled to do what they can, then you have a kind of renewal, it's like an incarnational thing, Think, you know, new life bubbles up from below, whereas most of the time we, we hope that it'll drip down from above. If we get the best musician, if we get the best uh, Fender guitars, we get the best loudspeaker system. And I don't, I don't think that really works. I think we have to, we have to find ways of enabling people. One of four believe they can't sing. That's the kind of statistic. To believe that all God's people people who are deaf and dumb, as well as people who can vocalize, all of God's people can sing. And when we do that well in church and imaginatively in church, then we create an experience of worship and of intimacy with each other for which there's no comparison. The final thing I'll say is this morning, I had asked uh, the students in this uh, master's course in St. Andrews, if in advance, they might take a look at a hymn book and find out maybe 10 different kinds of tune. Well, they, they, they found this a very awkward thing to do uh, because they only thought, well, it's a hymn book, so it's hymn tunes and, and there's no difference. 
So gradually we went through, you know, so you've got a Tezi chant, you have a African-American spiritual, you have a, a chorale melody from Germany, you have a Christmas carol, you have a worship and praise song, you have a, a, a kind of plain song melody. So it, there's about 20 different styles, genres, you'd call them. And I said to them, so if the song of the church is made up of 20 different styles, what does that mean? And again, I mean, they'd never thought in these terms at all. And I said, doesn't it mean that they should be sung in 20 different ways? And if we do everything the same, whether it's a praise band, you know, with every instrument playing every verse, or whether it's an organist who is scared stiff to let people sing unaccompanied, or who feels he'll be demeaned if he gets a wee, you know, boy or girl to play a recorder while he plays the piano. You know, we just have to expand the potential rather than make everything uh, 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 black and white rather than multicolored. Absolutely. Um, so that that first meeting um, was in the, on Iona, and we're both members of the Iona community which means that we follow a rule of life, which might sound a bit strange to some people, but it's a, a very interesting rule. And for me, a really important part of it is our commitment to working on justice and peace and whole, wholeness and reconciliation. Um, can you say a bit more about what that and kind of living by a rule in general means to you? Well, before I joined the community, I already was fairly well involved in a whole lot of, of justice issues. I think my grandfather, who was a communist, when I was 16, he stopped going to support Kilmarnock football team because they had agreed to play an all-white team from Rhodesia. Now, I don't know if my grandfather had ever met a black man in his life, but he thought there was something despicable about his football team entertaining, the word racist was not known then, but entertaining people who abhorred uh, those who are who are coloured. And from then, I suppose, you know, when I worked in London, I you know, went in marches against the Vietnam War when I, when I was a student uh, president in Glasgow University. I um, started a gay society, this is about 35 years ago, and was involved in the anti-apartheid movement. So all of that was part of, of, of my um, experience and part of my commitment. Uh, the difference that, that uh, becoming a member of the Iowa community made for me, and uh, uh, this is not for everybody, was it, it, it made it uh, important that I should deal with my devotional life. Nobody ever spoken to me in seminary or anywhere else about how I prayed or if I prayed or how I read the Bible. And here was a, a community, one of whose rules of life, one of whose disciplines, is that every day we are encouraged to read the scripture and pray. And I knew that all of my life, nobody, if I were a minister, would necessarily ask me about my devotional life. And I thought that's a very dangerous place to be. I need to be able to be accountable to somebody and to listen to other people as to how they see the Bible and how they pray. And, and that for me has been a major uh, blessing through being a member. Mm. Absolutely, I, I, I have felt similarly, so I can completely empathize with that. Um, a slightly more personal question, I guess. Y you chose to remain single for quite some time before you came out to enable your work in the church. And I suspect that that's a choice that many of you, people, the people here at will have made a sing similar choice and had similar experiences. I was wondering how you feel about that now, looking back. Well, well, I'm glad that you said uh, <clears throat> single and not celibate. Somebody put onto, I, I don't look at Wikipedia, somebody put onto Wikipedia that I was celibate. As if you're some kind of hermit monk, you know, who's kind of given up realizing you're a sexual being. Uh, I, I, before I, I came out, most people uh, who had anything to do with me knew that I was gay. I mean, I, 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 it was when I was at. It was when I come back from London. I'd, yeah, I'd, in London, I had. Um, I realised I, I took a year away from out of university. I was on the point, perhaps, of being engaged to a girl who had been out with for three years. I went to London. I knew, although I mean, coming from Kilmarnock, I mean, it was like 
or is there any other gay in Kilmarnock? The first other gay I met in Kilmarnock was my wee brother, one of my wee brothers, you know, who turned out. My mother had two out of three. Um, so I so so I, I come back from London and I'll, I, I admitted it to myself and to some other people. But when I was at university, um, when some students came to see me when I was students president and said, we don't have a gay society in this university. And uh, it would be very good if we had one. So I set about bringing one into creation and then thought, well, I should be open about this, certainly to my parents, which was no bother. And from then on, anybody who, 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 who you know, worked with me or came close to me, would, I would, I'd let them know. But uh, I had a relationship for four years uh, with our partner. We lived with each other for four years. I'd known him for a while before. And in the fifth year of this relationship, some, a, a minister within the Church of Scotland uh, had a whiff that I might be gay. And so he, uh, he said about a rumour, which eventually came to my bosses, and I was hauled up in front of three uh, men and told in no uncertain terms that I could either have my vocation or I could have my relationship. And the relationship was not at its best then. I don't know that we would have gone on for all that much longer, but I thought it was an awful way in which to have to end it. I had taken vows to the church and I hadn't taken any vows to my partner then. So uh, I, gave, I gave up and I mean, this is, this is so, it's not embarrassing, it's embarrassing for the church. One of the people who were told to keep an eye on me said, no, you know, Mr. Bell, uh, things will be very difficult uh, for you, but perhaps you will find an understanding woman. Well, I thought, what's she going to understand? They were not going to have any sex. I mean, it's, I was bad enough feeling a discrimination against, a discrimination against gay people. But this was a, almost a blasphemy against women. The women were there partly to support men who weren't totally heterosexual so that they could kid on being what they were not. Well, from then on, the job, uh, you know, I, 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 had, I changed my job from working for the Church of Scotland to work for the Iona community, kept my ministerial status, made it quite clear to the community that if they employed me, then they were employing somebody who was gay. Yeah. And I never let that feature too highly in public because uh, I had been asked to convene a, a committee of the church. I'd been asked to be in charge of a hymnal project. And I also, uh, I've worked as I still do with other people and we have a common salary pool. And what we earn is what enables us to, to survive. And I didn't want to jeopardize the well-being of my colleagues by being, you know, more openly out. Uh, and so I kind of, you know, I, I kept that under wraps. Now, I don't expect everybody would have to do that. Uh, for me, it was important. My life was not all about my sexuality. My life was about other things. And I had to find a balance where I would not be denying who I was, but at the same time, not uh, dropping hints, which would uh, become the rumor, which uh, would surround me everywhere I went. And then, you know, I, I eventually, as you alluded to, Kate, it came out in public. Yeah. Years Thank you. And I think that's, it's a really helpful thing to hear um, for, for allies here today that for a lot of people, a coming out journey is a lot longer or older or more complex than people see um, in, in the public sphere, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But in 2017, you did decide to come out kind of a lot more publicly, shall we say, very publicly. Um, can you tell us a bit about what led you to make that decision? And I guess how you felt just before you gave the talk at Greenbelt where you came out. Yeah, um, I had been thinking about it for a while. I knew that uh, I was uh, of an age when I could be retiring soon. And therefore, you know, if, if I were penalized by the church for making this declaration in public, then, you know, perhaps that was okay. I could live my life uh, quite happily. But what sprung it was uh, uh, the, the death by suicide of a girl in Manchester 
and a girl called Lizzie Lowe. Now, I, don't, I knew nothing about her. But when I was on holiday in Spain, I heard the radio. It was something from the, the Church of England's, um, uh, I forget what you call it, General Synod, uh, in which um, a, a, a priest in Manchester spoke of how in his congregation was a girl called Lizzie Lowe, who was a babysitter for him, a wee girl of about 13, 14, uh, who, had, who had committed suicide. She hung herself. And in the inquest that followed her death, one of her friends alluded to how she had sent a, a text message the day or two before saying that she didn't believe that God could love her because of the way that she was. Now, she, unknown to her parents, or many friends, realised that she was lesbian. That was her natural giftedness with regard to her sexuality. And she was in a, a religious environment where that had been looked on very harshly and seen, if not as sinful, then as something which was really certainly to be avoided at all costs. And I suppose, you know, looking towards the future, as sometimes kids do when they're that age, she didn't think she'd be able to survive being ostracised and being penalised for, for and being unable to be true to what she was. And at that time, I, I felt no child of God should ever get to the point of need, needing to take their life because they cannot be who they are. And I thought, you know, this is the time when I'm going to speak. Uh, I'll, I'll put it in the context of a, a talk about heterosexualism, but uh, the genesis is that this wee girl's death has to be pre prevented from happening to anybody else. And those of us who, who have the possibility of being open should, should declare that. So that, no, not as role models, but just to let people know that folk functioning in society are gay, even if you don't know that. So that was the, that was. Now, how did I feel? You know, I, I just I just felt the time was right. Uh, I had no difficulty about that. I'd already spoken on gay issues in different places before then. My, you know, I, somebody kind of warned me that it might make news. I, I didn't, you know, that didn't kind of bother me. As it happened, it went into two or three church newspapers, with the exception of the news magazine of the Church of Scotland. They knew, I told them what I was going to say. You know, I, was I told them I was going to come out. I also had felt we have only, we've got one out minister in the Church of Scotland. And I really felt he was taking a bit of a battering. I thought somebody else should, you know, should stand beside him. I know him uh, well. And I thought it's time somebody else was, was uh, uh, beside him. So I let the church know what I was going to say, but they would not, uh, they wouldn't allude to it. At all. So I don't know if there's anybody <laughs> looking in who belongs to the Church of Scotland. My name's John Bell and I'm gay, but the church doesn't want to know. <laughs> Which is a real shame. Um, <laughs> so apart apart from, from the Church of Scotland, how was it for you um, being out in public and it being talked about in various papers and so on? It, it didn't make a bit of difference. I never, I never noticed it. I, 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 I was afraid, you know, there might be some backlash. There, there, there wasn't any at all, you know. So, and I felt, I, I felt happy for my colleagues, um, particularly uh, my long-term colleague who's, who's called Graham. And Graham's a very, you know, full-blooded, healthy heterosexual, but he and I lived uh, together for about maybe 15 years, along with other people. And because our names are associated with each other, it was you know, quite probable or possible that people might have thought that we were an item, which we certainly never were. Uh, and uh, I, 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 it was just good for me to feel, well, now it's quite open. I'm the one who's gay, and mm -hmm. he's the one who's not. And, and anybody who wants to ask, that's the answer, just in case they're interested. Yeah, no, it's good when you can start to kind of undo the rumours and tell the truth, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, I, don't think, I, I don't think we're... I don't think God's expectation of us is that we should live a lie. And I think when you feel you're compromising too much, you, you, you just have to take the risk of being totally open. 
be really nice. So I'm going to go back onto the, the music a bit for a little bit. Um, your songs are loved by many congregations and Christians. Um, what inspires you to write? Uh, but I get asked that quite a lot, but I'm always kind of stuck for an answer uh, because it's really kind of necessity. Uh, both within myself, I feel, you know, a compulsion, but also when you identify a situation or an experience which, which hasn't been articulated and which is common to people. Um, you know, I, I'm, I, at the moment, I'm beginning to, after the death of my, my colleague, I'm beginning to catalogue a whole lot of our material. And I realised that in the early material, but for the first 10 years, say 1984 to, 18, to 1984 to 1994, there were a whole lot of songs about the life of Jesus. And, and the, the determination for that was that the, that the church didn't have songs about the life of Jesus. We either had the birth or the death, or I love you, Jesus, you love me, and we're as happy as happy can be. But there was nothing about his words, his ministry. I went through hymnals and... You know, the life of Christ would go past almost like the Apostles' Creed in a comma. You're born of the Virgin Mary, comma, suffered under Pontius Pilate. So people, people were stuck with gentle Jesus, weak and mild. You know, three adjectives which don't appear together in the Gospels. And, you know, given that meek now means somebody who's spineless, it meant humble in the 16th century. We shouldn't be singing that kind of nonsense. It, it, it diminishes Christ to make him out as some kind of eternally passive figure. We need a robust Jesus. So it was, it was the need for these kind of songs that made us uh, work on uh, quite a lot. And, and since then, uh, I suppose there've been you know, pastoral moments uh, where you realize whether to do with death and also to do with, with, uh, with suffering, with people who are gossiped against, I mean, there's a there's a woman, a saint of God called Dorothy McCree McMahon, who's a, a oh, a, 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 just a stunning woman a, in Australia, and she is and she's retired a long time, Dorothy, and she's in a, a very deprived suburb of South Sydney, and discovered that there was in the community a, a lot of people who had known the effects of child abuse, either in themselves or in their friends or their family. And she felt it was time that the church did something about this. And so they were preparing to call a gathering of people within a local community who had been affected by this in whatever way. And there was no song for it. You know, the number of people who suffer from sexual abuse, particularly as children, is embarrassingly high. We don't have a vocabulary to speak about it in the church. People are embarrassed to talk about it. And we certainly don't have a vocabulary for those who are the victims to allow them to feel that other people are standing with them. So that's the, that's the kind of thing. I mean, that or, you know, I'm, I could think of moments when I've been in a, in a conversation with people and some somebody innocently has just opened the door to a, a, a deeper understanding of the Bible. And I might think, oh, that is so good. We should have that in a song. We should have that in a song. So it's, it's some, you know, a, a compulsion within myself. It's not something which I do every day. I don't feel that I have to write or I have to be published. Uh, and it's nearly always uh, uh, to, to do with a, an issue for which there is maybe insufficient material. And so I, I, I write uh, for, for that moment uh, and for that person or for that place. And if it has, you know, use elsewhere, that's a bonus. But primarily, it's for it's a kind of one-off, really. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. That's that's fantastic. So you're probably really fed up of being asked about this song. So I'm really sorry, but one of my favourite songs is the summons, um, which some watching might know as well. You come and follow me, and. It's kind of my favourite song despite myself because I think some churches use it a lot and think that it's very cheery or light 
But for me, I found some of the lyrics really profound. And in particular, the line, will you love the you you hide if I but call your name was very important to me as I was transitioning. And whenever I'm tempted to go back into hiding and to not speak publicly about being trans, that line comes back into my head, that sense of needing to love the you you hide. Can you remember what that meant to you when you wrote it? And does it mean anything different now? Well, it's interesting that you, you that you meant you, you talk about that song because uh, well, last week two people from different parts of the country wrote to ask uh, about that or to make some comment about it. And I suppose if if I'd been the type of person who kept a a note of when people have made a comment on a song, I could have filled a book with testimonies on on just that that song. Now it's not about me, uh, I have to say. Uh, when Graham and I were doing youth work for the Ainu community. We had a cadre of volunteers. We had maybe up to about 60 part and full time. We had people who had, were between the ages of about 18 and 24 who gave up a year of college or work. Uh, and they had to go in the dole and live in areas of, uh, of social deprivation. And at the end of that time, after a year, or some say for two years, we would have a kind of a liturgy to send them out into what they're doing next. And we would try to write a song for um, for, for the, pe the person who was going. So uh, that was one of them for uh, for a particular individual. And, and, you know, we would look at the person's life and try to reflect how they had grown or things they had said or what they had discovered. But the, the thing about loving the you, you hide for me is a is a significant thing because Jesus asks us to love our neighbor as ourself, which means that love of the neighbor is to some extent predicated on the love of the self. And if you cannot love yourself, if you find yourself despicable, if you find yourself, you know, disposable as in the case of Lizzie Lowe, then you may end up kind of throwing at other people the disappointment or the anger or the frustration that's building up inside. And I, I mean, I don't do much pastoral, pastoral work, but, you know, I'm thinking over the years, particularly with, uh, with men who have been in a bit of a mess, and, and sometimes I'll say to them, do you love yourself? And these can be priests and pastors as well as lay people. And then they start crying because it's the very thing that they don't do. And so I, 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 you know, I think that the, the, the call of Jesus is to love this being who we are and to love the bits that we feel might, or either are, are judged as unrespectable by other people in society or, 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 the, or the bits that we fear might be dangerous. Once they are owned, then they can be dealt with. But if they're denied, if, there's, if they're... If they're, if they're hidden behind a, a cover, a cloak, a mask, then they become they, they could become very dangerous. There's a, there's a, a guy, an old uh, minister in Glasgow, years ago, he, he was counselling a friend of mine who'd had a breakdown, I mean, a nervous breakdown. And he said to him, Jack, a nervous breakdown happens when all your orphaned children are crying out to be loved. You know, I, I just find that such a, a, a wonderful thing to say that, that all of us have bits of our being which aren't integrated. You know, they're, 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 they're being hidden, they're being kept apart. And if there are enough of them, they ally together and they force us to have a mental breakdown. All our orphan children are crying out to be loved. So, so love, while we speak about it as that which is unselfish, which is altruistic, which is gracious and affirming, is also something which we have to give ourselves. If, if, and we cannot believe that God loves us if we don't love ourselves. In fact, we're, we're, we're doubting God. We're saying, you couldn't possibly love me. I'm unlovable. So, you know, I, I think behind that, that phrase, well, you love it, you, you hide there's a, a whole lot, which will mean different things to different people. I mean, two years ago in America, a pastor in 
where a Washington DC said that he was on his way out of the church. And then he came across that text and that particular line and he, he, he felt that he could stay. Thank you. There's some really amazing stories in there and hundreds more, I'm sure. Um, so we're going to soon move to questions from other people in the audience. And so I should really ask you a few questions about OpenTable um, before then. So I'm going to do that now. What does the OpenTable network mean to you as a patron? Well, I don't know much about it. You know, <laughs> I've... I've been asked several times to come to Liverpool and I've never managed it, partly because of, uh, of COVID-19. But I do believe that, that it's important that there is a place where people who find themselves on the fringe of the church, particularly because of their sexuality, should, should find a, a place of confidence and of welcome and of, and of sharing. And this is not to despise, this is not to you know, be a breakaway congregation. I think that that uh, if, you're, if you're coming out or, or you're transitioning or you're having a hard time with sexuality, uh, perhaps it's best to speak to other people who have a common experience before you begin to make that something which is public within, within your church. And, and, you know, the church always advances when there are groups on the fringe who draw attention to something which the centre is refusing to look at. You know, whether that with, in the anti-apartheid movement, you know, even white theologians struggling with the doctrine, the theological doctrine of apartheid and saying, this is not what God demands. And women, you know, for, for so long being sidelined, saying from the sidelines, you are being unfaithful to scripture if you think that we are just handmaids of men. And so in, a, in the same way, you know, people in an organization or with a community like Open Table will, will find encouragement in each other to begin, if need be, to challenge the assumptions of people who look down on folk whose uh, sexuality is different from theirs. Absolutely, thank you. It sounds to me like you know an awful lot about Open Table, even whilst not knowing some of the specifics. So well done there. Um, one more question before I hand over to others. Um, there's been a lot in the media recently about the churches or Christians that disagree with or harm LGBT people. How can we sit at a table with people who would disagree with us or exclude us as LGBT Christians? Essentially, I think that we have to show ourselves as bigger than them. That uh, they may be forbidding of us to sit and enjoy the Eucharist with them, and I don't see any reason to retaliate and say, you can't sit at the Eucharist with us. I think it's more a matter of saying, you can sit at the Eucharist with us. We are sorry that this is how you feel, but we don't feel that against you. And, you know, it's interesting that, that in the Gospels, Jesus meets so many people who are despised by society and as he gathers people around a table. Not that, not that there's any comparison between prostitutes and tax collectors and people who are LGBTQ or whatever, but the thing that, dis, that, that dismays John's disciples when they come looking for Jesus is the company that he keeps and the fact that he quite enjoys being in the company of people who are not of his religion or not of his race or not of his gender and, and, and that he shares with them. And... You know, if the cross were to become taboo as a symbol of Christian faith, the table would have to be the other symbol because it's central to his ministry. There's about 17 times in the Gospels where he is found at table with, with other people and they're not always his friends. Some are even hostile towards them. So, you know, open table mo models that. And if, if we might be forbidden from going to other tables, at least let not our table be forbidden to them. Absolutely, and that kind of challenging exclusion with, inc with inclusion can be so powerful. So um, I think we're ready now to move to some questions from some of the other people here, and I can see there's a few there 
already. If anyone's got a question that they haven't asked yet, feel free to send it in. Um, so the first question I've got here is from someone who heard you speak at Greenbelt whilst you wore a bright yellow suit. And um, Christopher, who asked the question, wants to know, was there any significance to the colour and can you recommend a tailor? <laughs> well, I, I don't remember that particular occasion, but I, I do actually, um, I have a kind of uh, affection for bright colours. I suppose it's growing up, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the source of it. Once in Bristol Theological College, the Anglican College, I asked these Anglicans what colour they associated with God. And I thought that, you know, some of them would be high Anglicans, so it would be gold or it could be purple or whatever. Now, there would be about, about 60 people in this, this class I was teaching. And 90% of them portrayed God as white. And 5% as black, these were the colours, not the skin colour, but the, 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 you know, the tincture, the, 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 the colour they associated with the Almighty. 95% white, 5% black. And then they discovered that the 5% who thought God was black were all Methodists, whose pastors wore black gowns. And the 95% who thought God was white were Anglicans, whose pastors wore white surpluses. And at that point, it confirmed in me that I was never going to wear black, uh, unless perhaps at a funeral. Uh, unlike my compatriots who not only wear black, but let people see they've got a BSc in architecture by having a fancy hood over their shoulder. And I also thought, you know, as I get older, there is no reason why I should become more um, dull in my clothing. So I wear red shoes, not all the time, but some of the time, and occasionally I'll wear yellow. And this afternoon I was wearing green. I don't, and, and, and to some extent, an exp it's an expression of my character. I don't, I'm not an, a full-time extrovert. I've, I've got a very big introverted side. But I think that life and God were made for colour. And, and why, why limit yourself to only one? Mm, what a fantastic answer. And I'm <laughs> not sure that the questioner was expecting such a deep answer. So <laughs> but, well done, John. Uh, but Alec, if it comes to a tailor, it's usually Oxfam or Save the Children, if that's any help. There you go. So um, Tim wants to know, are social justice issues more important to stand up for than preserving the idea of a church communion, thinking of the worldwide church? Can you, can you see that again? Our, you yes, see it again? so it was, are social justice issues more important than stand, to stand up for than preserving the idea of uh, church communion, or I guess church unity, um, thinking of the worldwide church? Oh, I see. So that, that could be to do with the issues regard to sexuality and how some churches want to kind of avoid having any part in it, you know, uh, it could have for one time have been to do with apartheid in South Africa. I, I think that when, I, when a church takes a stance which demeans those who are made in the image of God, then that church deserves to have either a sanction put on it or some kind of discipline. Now, we don't have an ecumenical body which overshadows Roman Catholic and Lutheran and Anglican and Orthodox and everything. Mm. But I think that, that when the actions of a, of a church or a denomination begin to demean those who are made in the image of God, particularly forcing them to deny that which they are, then those of us who believe that we're all made in God's image have to point that out. And it may be that that particular church will want to disassociate itself from us. I don't think we give people their marching orders, but I think that we, I think that we stay where we stand, and and also that we are are quite clear that that social justice for Christians has its roots in the Bible, that the personal salvation 
is certainly part of the deal. But the social justice is shot through the prophets and the law and the gospel and the acts and the letters of the New Testament. And that we can't pick and choose which aspects of social justice we, we, we prefer and are in favour of. Now, we can't, we can't you know, give to every charity and we can't support every justice issue. We just can't do that. It's impossible. But we can make sure that, that, that when we speak of social justice, we're not just keeping it to the easier areas of life, which are easy to speak about and which don't cost much to be involved in. But they would respect that social justice is, is an all-encompassing thing and that God demands it across the board and not just in the issues which we feel might be pious eh, and holy. Thank you. Um, Rhythm would like to know something about your music. Um, she would like to know, is it the lyrics or the music that comes first or is it a mixture of both? It, it, uh, it depends. I don't have a technique um, at all. So sometimes a tune will come into my head and I might think, oh, that's quite a good tune. I'll write it down. And I put it in a kind of a bank of tunes. And maybe a year, two years later, uh, I'll think, oh, there might be words for that. Or I might be looking at some words and 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 discover that there's a tune already written which, which accommodates it. And sometimes it's just a phrase um, which where the, the music and the words come together at the same time. Uh, I'm trying to think of, uh, of um, oh, I remember, I remember the phrase in Christ we live and in Christ we die and in Christ we rise up again. Now, um, this is something which I worked on about five years ago. And just as I came across the phrase, I'm thinking of in Christ we live and in Christ we die and in Christ we rise up again. So there was no, no, no before or after. And sometimes it's, it's, the, it's the words first. There's a thing I was working on recently where uh, I, was, I was working on a particular text and had more or less finished it and, and there's no tune for it. But I'm happy to leave it there and then the tune might come later. But what, what I, although this is not a question, what I always say to people, you know, if they ask me, how do you write a hymn or can I send you some material and you, I'd, I'd say, I'm the worst adjudicator in the world. It's got to do with me. If you think you've written something which is worthy of people singing it, not a personal song, but a, a, a community song, a church song, find people who owe you no favours and ask them to sing it. And then ask them to say, whether it speaks of God to them or of them to God, and if they can get the tune, that's preferable. And if they owe you no favours, they'll say, eh, it's not very great, or this could be improved, or this is quite good, and, and you take it. You know, the, the Holy Spirit is the arbiter of good taste through the community. There was, last week or the week before, there was this lovely comment on the radio where someone was talking about a government minister, I won't mention which one, they're all lovely men, mostly. Uh, and the, the, the government minister was saying, we have made it quite clear. We have made this process absolutely clear. And the person who was commenting on that said, clarity of communication should not be judged by the person who speaks, but by the person who listens. And in certainly congregational music and the songs of the church. It's the congregation who are the arbiters to some extent as to whether this is for them or it's a private devotional poem which the person who wrote it can recite to their heart's content. Thank you, that's really good advice. Um, back to the summons, um, Vera Maxwell has asked, there are two versions of to the tune of the sun and same tune but different rhythms. So I think, I guess there was talking about the bouncy one and the straight one. Oh, um, is, is there a reason for this, do you know? And which was the original, if you can remember? <laughs> yes, the original was neither. There are two, there are two, you know, I, I sometimes say, if you were in the Boy Scouts or the Boys Brigade and you marched, Bum, 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 sometimes that's the noise. Uh, that's the speed it would go at as well. 
if you were if you were a dancer, you da da dum da di da dum da di di. Now, when we wrote it, my colleague Graham, uh, he he sang it, and he would usually sing. Sometimes he'd sing the first four verses solo, and then everyone would join in the last verse. But 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 when he sang it, he just he just made the tune go with his go with his um, as as he felt it. So he would sing, "Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know?" So he was kind of speaking it in musical sound. And and that's the way in which I prefer it. But if people say, would you go for the, the, the cheap and cheerful marchy tune or would you go for the slightly more relaxed three, four melody, I would go for the second. I, 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 I kind of walking piece. Cool, thank you. Um, so I've got one more question um, come through and it's about whether or not you did an interview with Nick Bundock, who um, I believe is the minister um, from Lizzie Lowe's church. So, so Storm wanted to share with us that, that they watched um, that video and that it was really helpful to them and helped them to understand that you could be gay and Christian. And they were wondering if it was you that was part of that. Uh, I was asked by Nick, who I've met several times. A lot, I mean, just a stunning, stunning priest. You should maybe, maybe just say a wee word about him. When Lizzie Lord died, he had to take her funeral. I mean, it must have been the most awful thing to have the, to bury a child of God who's taken her life. Grieving congregation. And he decided that the congregation should now talk. It was an Anglican evangelical congregation. Talk about the issue of how we deal with people whose sexuality is not what most would consider to be normal. And, and it was done over three or four nights with, a, with I think, a psychologist, with a theologian, with a biblical scholar, with a counsellor. And, and, and then the congregation came to a common mind that they would be uh, accepting and affirming of gay people. Some people left. Some people even wouldn't, wouldn't even talk about it. They just thought, no, if this is up for conversation, we're going. But uh, then, then they left. And one of, one of the, the things that happened thereafter was that he thought he was being asked by some of his evangelical colleagues if there was anything which was you know, on YouTube or whatever to do with this issue. And so uh, Lizzie's parents were keen to finance the possibility of, 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 of a short kind of film where um, he and I would dialogue with each other. Uh, and eventually, it was a it was a lesbian and gay organisation who, who who paid for it. But uh, I, yes, I was very very happy. I mean, I'm sorry that it wasn't longer and it didn't really go into all that much depth. But I think for people who want something which is quite safe and accessible, then it, it seems to be quite a good kind of uh, starter for conversation. The lovely thing was, you know, after I'd recorded it, I went. I stayed another day in uh, Didsbury, which is where his parish is, and there was a, a meeting at night where people could come and 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 talk with me, and <laughs> nearly all the questions were about music. And he eventually said, "Actually, you know, John's here uh, about something else, <laughs> other than music." So we had a conversation about you know about how how people regarded those who are lesbian, gay, whatever. But what I what I loved was that in the congregation. So that congregation had had grown in its compassion. It was supporting a number of asylum seekers to get residence in Britain. And in the people who gathered that night, there were people who were probably intellectually challenged, who'd never been in church before, and people there who were, you know, gay or lesbian or whatever, who would never have darkened the door of that church. But because it took a stand and say we have to, you know, swallow our pride and affirm other people and accept them as God's children, it, it just it changed, you know, the congregation. That's brilliant to hear about. Thank you. And Kieran has helpfully shared the link to the interview in the chat. So there you go. If anyone wants mm. a starting point conversation, um, that's there in the chat. 
I've got a, a light question for you, John, to move us towards a close. If you could sit round the table with anyone, who would it be? I would like to sit with the man, the Church of Scotland minister, who outed me. Well, at that time, you know, who, who let my employers know that I was gay and I was living with another man, and this was against the law of the church. He's dead. I know who he is, and he's dead. And I'd like to sit with him at a table, uh, and partly it would be to, you know, to say that I forgive him, but I would also like to ask him, what is it that was dementing you which made you do this particular thing, squeal on me, and also give my name to the papers. It was through the papers that he, 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 had, he had phoned the Sunday Mail, you know, which is not perhaps the most liberal of newspapers, and told them there was a minister in Glasgow working with young people who was in a homosexual relationship. Now, um, over the last two or three weeks, in different contexts within churches and organisations, I've noticed how when, when there's difficulty, um, it sometimes starts with an individual who is a malcontent in themselves. And, and they just foment bother and difficulty all around them. It's as if they are trying to work out their own anxieties by making other people anxious. And, and I, I think, you know, if I were being... Honest, not just charitable, but honest. I think the guy who made life very difficult for me must have been dealing with something in his life or his personality which kept him in turmoil. Maybe part of the self that he had refused to love and was trying to hide. So it may be a happy conversation. It may not. Thank you, John. That's an absolutely wonderful way to, to end and to hear that grace in, in the conversation that you would like to have um, is fantastic. You've shared with us so many stories and insights and I suspect when this video is published people will be going back to hear bits of what you've said again. So thank you so much for, for the rich conversation which I've truly enjoyed as well. Before I do a few announcements, is there anything that you want to say that I've not asked the right question for you to, to share with us? No, not at all. No, no, this has been great. And I really do want to congratulate Open Table and the, 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 you know, the, the number of people who are connected with it and the fact that you exist, you know, <laughs> if it existed when I was in my, in my early 20s, well, I don't know, I might have made my life very different. But I think it's great that, that now... Uh, and Liverpool, which is a city which I which I love dearly, that, that, that this is there. So God bless you all and uh, keep at it. Don't give in. Thank you so much. So if you enjoyed this evening, you might want to come along to our next patrons Q&A, which is um, the last one, I think, on the 20th of May, which is a Thursday from seven to eight, we're going to have Barbara Glasson, who is the former president of the British Methodist Conference. Barbara is a pastoral theologian who's worked among people of many different faiths and experiences. And in 2000, she founded Somewhere Else, which is an inclusive faith community in Liverpool, where people gather to bake bread and worship God. There she met LGBT Christians and other groups that she calls prophetic communities, which actually brings to mind quite a bit of our conversation this evening. Her book, The Exuberant Church, Listening to the Prophetic People of God, reflects on coming out as a spiritual experience and how the church must to come out. And Barbara kind of sees in that coming out process um, that it's profoundly human and deeply of God. As Barbara became president of the Methodist Conference in 2019, the Methodist Church approved a report called God in Love Unites Us, which proposed to churches um, to be allowed to hold same-sex weddings. And that report is being discussed at the moment. Um, but sadly, because of COVID, Barbara wasn't able to see the final vote before she stepped down um, last July. Barbara now teaches pastoral theology at the Queen's Foundation for Ecumenical Theological Education in Birmingham. 
So John, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, thank you, Sarah and Kieran for sorting out the technology and Andy for signing for us. It's been a fantastic evening. Thank you and good night. <laughs>